Hey everyone, we are learning today about how we are going to glorify God in this time. Today I want us to look at three vineyards. What a vineyard is, basically, is that they are elevated vines that grow grapes. And today I want us to look at three different vineyards that we find in Scripture. With your kids, right here at the very beginning, I want you to talk about what your favorite fruit is and why. Talk about it. The first vineyard that I want us to look at today is found in Isaiah chapter 5. If you'll turn there with me, that would be awesome. But the, uh, the scripture is going to be on the screen for you today. Let's read it together. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and he cleared it of stones. He planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, and he hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes. Now I want you to see this is totally positive up to this point. Okay, The man who's building the vineyard, he does everything in his power. He plugs money into it. He works hard at getting it ready. And yet look what we find here in our next little part. But it yielded wild grapes. And now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there for me to do for my vineyard? That I have not done in it. When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For this vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Okay, the vineyard that the Lord plants, that is the house of Israel. The men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Here we see God as the planter who goes to all of this effort, all right, to put Israel in a place where they would be successful. As he called them out of Egypt and moved them into the promised land, what he did was that he made a place for them to be successful. A place where they would prosper and a place where they would be good people. The problem with this is that once they got into the land, once they received everything that the Lord had given them, they were not the kind of people that God wanted them to be. Despite time, love, and care by God, Israel did not uphold justice or righteousness. Instead, he sends destruction as a result of their disobedience. Foreign nations would invade and conquer Israel and send them into exile. So as a family, right now, I want you to talk about this question. Discuss how a man described as a sour grape would live. And then second, I want you to discuss how would a man who is described as a good man, how would that man live? Talk about those as a family, and we'll come back in just a second. The second vineyard I want us to look at comes from Mark chapter 12. If you'll turn there with me, it will be on the screen for you. Jesus uh, often told parables to confuse the Pharisees. And when Jesus tells this parable that we find in Mark chapter 12, they have questioned his authority. They have said, what authority, by what authority do you do these wondrous things? And so Jesus has this parable in response to that. And he tells them this, and sometimes when, when, we speak in, when Jesus speaks in parables, we don't always understand exactly where he's going. So I want to explain this one to you today. Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 1. He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. Now, if you'll notice here, this is very similar to the vineyard in Isaiah chapter 5, except that he builds this vineyard and then he goes away into a foreign land and leaves the vineyard with these workers to work the land. Let's see what happens next. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. They took him, they beat him, and they sent him away in the empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant. 
And they struck him on the head, and they treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat, and some they killed. He still had one more, a beloved son. Finally he sent to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. They took him, they killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. In the same way in Isaiah chapter 5 that God plants the vineyard, he plants this one as well. Except it's not the vines that are the nation of Israel this time. Instead, the tenants are the nation of Israel, the ones who are working the land and keeping the vineyard. Now the Lord sends someone to the vineyard to collect some of the fruit, and they kill him. They beat some of them. And those servants that the Lord sends, those are the prophets, men like Isaiah, men like Hosea, who speak to the nation of Israel. And then you have this last-ditch effort by the master to gain back control of his vineyard, and that's his only son, his beloved son. And when he arrives, the people, the tenants in the vineyard, they kill him, hoping to take some of the inheritance, hoping to gain the vineyard for themselves. This beloved son, as you probably well have guessed, is Jesus, the one who comes and dies. And then we see what the Lord is going to do. I'll read it again for you. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. We're going to talk about the others that are mentioned there in just a second. But before we do that, I want you to ask and answer this question. Why do you think that the tenants lashed out and killed the son? What do you think was going on in their heart? Talk about it as a family, and we'll come back together for the third vineyard. Let's take a look at our third vineyard, our last vineyard. And this comes in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to read it for you. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. At the beginning, we asked the question, how do we glorify God in this time? And here's the answer. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Now this time, God is not uh, necessarily the planter, but he is the vine dresser. That means that he is walking and meticulously pruning and cutting off unproductive branches. And in this scenario, Jesus calls himself the true vine. So you have God who is meticulously gardening this vine, and then you have Jesus who is the vine, and then you have the branches. And the branches are the children of God. In Mark chapter 12, we heard that God would give the vineyard to others. We, the church of today, are the others that Jesus was talking about. We are the others 
And in this scenario, we are these branches, these branches that are supposed to produce fruit. Some of them bear fruit, and as a result, they are pruned, and they are cut away a little bit so that they would produce more fruit in the future. And then the second type of branch we have is we have branches that produce no fruit. And what the Bible says is that God will come and he will cut off those branches that are not producing fruit and throw them away. He will cast them away eventually to be burned. Jesus has made a way for us to have life. We have life in Jesus when we abide in the vine. One question at the very beginning that we talked about was how do we glorify God in this time? And, and Jesus answers it very clearly right now. And he says this in verse 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So here's the question. How do we bear fruit so that we can glorify God? We do that in two ways. One is internal fruit. The Bible talks about when Jesus invades our life, when we abide in Christ, he takes our heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh. The result of that is that we become exceedingly more like Jesus as time progresses. So what that means is the sin that is so deeply entrenched in your heart is removed and Jesus is there. Now what happens is we still have this sinful nature and we have this tendency to go towards sin. But Jesus tells us that when he invades our life, he will make us more like him. And so the fruits of the Spirit begin to grow in us. That is the internal fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control from Galatians 5. Those things grow up in us. Right now, we're on the property of a wonderful lady. Her name is Miss Buckley. And I love her to death because she has had such a profound impact on my life. Miss Buckley willingly and lovingly displays all of these fruits often. She is well advanced in age now. But you can obviously see that Jesus has done a great work in her life. The second way that we produce fruit is we produce external fruit. Fruit on the outside of us, meaning that we grow fruit on others to the best of our ability. We share the good news of who Jesus is, what he has done, and we encourage and urge others to be a part of that, to willingly lay down their life before a holy God and believe on Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. Those are the ways that we produce fruit. And today I would encourage you, the way that you glorify God with your life is that you produce fruit. As a family, before we finish today and after I pray, will you discuss together how you as a family can better glorify God, how you as a family can produce fruit in your life? Let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that you are the vine. And that if we only abide in you, you make us more like yourself, Jesus. We love to love you. Jesus, I pray that as families, that we would grow closer to you. That we would abide fully in you. And even when tough times come, even when things in our lives seem way up in the air, Lord, that we would trust in the vine. Jesus, give us peace in this time. In this time where there's a lot of uncertainty, grow in us peace. A peace that surpasses all understanding. Jesus, we love you. We love your word. I pray that you would use it to make us more like your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Y'all have a wonderful, wonderful day. Let's talk about our second vineyard. That second vineyard is, vineyard. he is the planter once again. <laughs> you sniffed! I already sniffed! Turn it off. Why did you stop?